Manichaeism was an ancient religion, named after the 3rd century visionary and prophet Mani. Among his many titles, he was called both an Apostle of Jesus Christ and the Buddha of Light. In these two titles, we see one of the defining features of Manichaeism. It was a universalist and missionary religion that was carried across the trade routes bridging Europe with Asia. Starting in the Sasanian Empire, it spread westward toward Rome and east toward China, adapting to its cultural surroundings wherever it ended up, including adapting terminology and ideas from Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism. We see this in what is possibly the only surviving Manichaean temple, which houses a statue of Mani appearing as the Buddha. In many respects, Manichaeism was a Silk Road religion. But what was Manichaeism all about? Who was its founder, Mani, and how did it relate to these other religions in antiquity? This episode of Religion for Breakfast was made possible by our awesome fans on Patreon. If you'd like to gain access to the Religion for Breakfast Discord server, as well as participate in exclusive monthly live streams, please consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash religionforbreakfast. Little is known with certainty about the founder of Manichaeism, Mani. Many legends surround his youth, upbringing, and life. Even his name, Mani, might be a religious title rather than a proper name, deriving from a Syriac word meaning, my living vessel. But what we know is that he was a world traveler, a prolific writer, and was remembered as a visionary healer and miracle worker. Mani lived most of his life in the Sasanian Empire, a Persian empire that covered much of Mesopotamia and modern-day Iran. He was born around 216 CE, among the Aramaic-speaking populations near the city of Ctesiphon on the Tigris River. And here in the marshlands of Mesopotamia, surrounded by a multi-religious population of Syriac Christians, Mandaeans, and Jews, Mani was raised within some sort of religious sect that practiced baptism. We know this from one of the most consequential discoveries for the study of Manichaeans, the Mani Codex, a credit card sized book discovered in Egypt in the 20th century, and it dates to the 5th century. The Mani Codex contains a description of Mani's life, presumably compiled by his earliest disciples. Now, despite some obvious embellishments in his biography, most scholars have accepted the information about his upbringing as historical. Based on the Mani Codex and other sources, many scholars now believe that we can identify the baptizing community of Mani's youth as the Christian Elkasite community, which would explain the prominent role of biblical narratives and Christian terminology in Manichaean thought. When Mani was a teenager, he received his first vision from a spiritual companion, a supernatural twin, that revealed hidden wisdom about a supernatural light imprisoned in the darkness of the material world. This light was even trapped inside animals and plants, and could be harmed by harvesting fruit and vegetables. In one of the most fascinating passages in the Mani Codex, Mani tells of a member of the Baptist sect who was bringing vegetables to the elder of the city, when suddenly the veggie starts talking. That vegetable wept and said to him, Are you not righteous? Are you not pure? Why then are you taking us to the fornicators? Similar stories about talking bread and talking palm trees highlight Mani's new message about how the supernatural light is trapped in our world and could be harmed in everyday life by everyday actions. He set out to reform the Baptist community, but his fellow baptizers did not appreciate his revelation and novel practices. These revelations led to conflicts within the community, and ultimately Mani broke away from them. At the age of 24, following yet another vision from his spirit twin, Mani embarked on a missionary phase of his movement. Manichaean texts describe him traveling all over Mesopotamia, Iran, and even sailing as far as India to the mouth of the Indus River. Mani apparently gathered followers and friends in high places, as seen in his relationship with the great Sasanian king, Shapur I. Manichaean literature says that Mani's public mission coincided with the coronation of Shapur, and later describes him gaining imperial support from Persian royalty. He even wrote a Middle Persian book for the king, in which he lays out his teachings. Ultimately, Mani's message and growing popularity led to animosity with one of the court priests, who managed to get Mani imprisoned and executed around the age of 60, an event that is remembered in Coptic Manichaean texts as a crucifixion, though it's much more likely he simply died in prison. 
it's difficult to untangle what parts of his biography are real and what parts are legendary. One legend describes that on his way back west from India, Mani traveled through the kingdom of Tehran in Central Asia, and was granted an audience with the king. The king of Tehran recognized Mani's authority and declares him the two titles that I mentioned at the start of this video. You are Blessed Buddha, you are the Apostle of God basically recognizing him as a new universalist prophet. But unlike so many religious founders, Mani actually left behind a lot of his own writings. It appears that Mani viewed himself in the mold of the Apostle Paul, writing letters and embarking on missionary journeys. In his own letters, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, self-reflectively using the same title that Paul adopted 150 years before. And although none of his texts survive in their entirety, the many fragments of Mani's own writings give us a glimpse into the early framework of Manichaean belief and practice. After his death, Mani's message lived on in a network of traveling missionaries with the support of local Manichaean communities. This so-called Manichaean church regarded itself as the carrier of a superior revelation, transcending previous wisdom revealed by other prophets like Jesus, the Buddha, and Zarathustra. A Coptic Manichaean text claims, my church surpasses the first churches because the first churches were chosen according to place, according to city. My church, it is provided for it to go out from all cities and its good news attains every country. This summarizes the universalist expansionism underlying Manichaean ideology. Jesus was sent to the west, Buddha to the east, Zarathustra to Iran, but Mani himself to the whole world. But what was this message? What did Manichaean beliefs and practices involve? The Manichaean myth revolved around a cosmological drama, the fate of the living soul, which is ensnared in the material world. The story goes something like this, though it's much more complicated. The living soul originated from the father of greatness, a transcendent god who stands outside of the universe, who through a series of emanations, or non-sexual acts of creation, surrounded himself with light beings that acted on his behalf. But this world of light had an enemy. Similar to Zoroastrians and Mandeans, Manichaeans believed in a universe in which light and darkness stood against each other in a primordial cosmological battle, a conflict that continued to define all of reality. The first man, or the primal man, one of the beings from the first emanation of the Father of Greatness, descended with his five sons to wage war against the realm of darkness but he was captured, stripped of his sons, and trapped there. Light beings from the second emanation came to the rescue. They awakened the first man by reminding him of his true destiny and origin. In the process, they fashioned the universe, which, despite being made from darkness, was considered to be working toward the liberation of the last bits of light that had been left behind. The elements of light imprisoned in the material world had several names. It was called the living soul, the cross of light, or in some Western sources, the suffering Jesus. This cosmological drama of the living soul being stuck in our world formed the foundation for Manichaean religious practice. Humankind could participate in this battle between light and dark through revealed knowledge, or gnosis, which has led some to compare it with other forms of Gnostic groups in antiquity. But the primary way humans engaged in the battle between light and dark was by following the rules and regulations of the Manichaean church as members of two classes, the elect and the hearers, who were also called catechumens in Western sources. There was a reciprocal relation between these two classes of Manichaeans. The elect needed the financial and material support of the hearers because the elect needed to keep strict rules of behavior. For example, since Manichaeans believed in a divine spark captured in the material world, simple acts like farming, drinking wine, or commerce could hurt this light. Harvesting food could be construed as potential murder. We saw this already in the Mani Codex, which tells stories like a baptizer climbing a palm tree to chop down some wood, and the palm tree cries out in pain. If you protect me from this pain, you will not die with the man who is trying to kill me. The Manichaean elect therefore lived an ascetic lifestyle, and depended on food that was donated in order to eat without guilt. Hearers, or catechumens, were expected to bring food as daily alms. 
By ingesting food, the Manichaean elect could purify and liberate the supernatural elements of light trapped inside defiling matter through their digestive processes. They themselves are not purified by eating the food, but rather they become the altars on which the food is offered and burned. The darkness and light mixture is dissolved and the light is liberated. This is the same ritual ridiculed by early Christian authorities. Saint Augustine, who himself was once a Manichaean before converting to Christianity, mocked this belief. And if one of the elect should eat the fig, after someone else, of course, committed the sin of picking it, after getting it into his guts would burp out angels, belching prayers the while. Another Christian bishop cites a Manichaean ritual prayer as evidence of their madness, calling it an apology to the bread. Neither have I cast it into the oven, another brought me this, and I have eaten it without guilt." Modern scholarship has shown that despite this mocking tone, this prayer must reflect an authentic Manichaean meal ritual of hearers bringing bread to the elect. Though detractors made fun of it, this remained a core practice for centuries. Here we see a reconstruction of one of the later depictions of the Manichaean meal ritual from an illustrated manuscript dating sometime between the 9th to 11th centuries. It illustrates not only the catechumens donating the food, but also the sun and the moon, the two storage vessels of the light according to Manichaean belief. We also have a massive amount of evidence of Manichaean prayers and liturgies preserved in the sands of Egypt. Manuscripts discovered at sites such as Medinet Mahdi and Kellis attest to a rich culture of prayers and psalms that were presumably performed in congregation. One prayer preserved on a piece of wood discovered in the Dakla oasis in Egypt reads, I worship and glorify all gods, all angels, all splendors, all luminaries, all powers, these which are from the great and glorious Father these which are purified of all darkness and malignance." This prayer had been transmitted in several languages, and the discovery of this artifact at Kellis shows that it was the text of the daily prayers for the hearers and the elect. Here we see a prayer that expresses both the strong universalism and dualism of Manichaean thought. We also see an indirect reference to the Manichaean mission of purifying the light from the darkness. Perhaps because of its universalism, or because of the importance of missionary journeys, Manichaeans demonstrated an endless capacity to adapt religious ideas from other cultures into their own religious framework. Another way we can define this is syncretism, which means adopting, adapting, or mixing religious elements from one culture into a native culture. Manichaean texts from various regions were written in the local languages and adopted religious analogies from their religious environments. For example, some scholars now theorize that Buddhism might have influenced Manichaeans, particularly around their shared belief in the transmigration of the soul, while Jainism shares the Manichaean idea of strict nonviolence based on the avoidance of harming plant life. The Manichaean cosmological drama also probably reflects Zoroastrianism. Manichaean cosmology can be summarized in two catchphrases, the two principles and the three times, which refers to the worlds of light and darkness and the three temporal stages of the cosmological drama, before the mixture of light and dark, the mixture itself, and the separation at the end of times. There's no doubt that both notions were rooted in Zoroastrian cosmology. Because so many Manichaean texts were written in Middle Persian, Parthian, and other Iranian languages, scholars of the early 20th century increasingly viewed Manichaeism as, in essence, an Iranian religion. Some argued that Manichaean cosmology is strongly related to the Zoroastrian sect, Zervanism, because Manichaeans used Iranian names for all Manichaean spiritual beings. The supreme deity of the Manichaean pantheon, the father of greatness, is called Zervan in Middle Iranian terminology, while Jesus and Adam and Eve are all given Iranian names. In addition to the Zoroastrian connection, Manichaeism also is deeply tied to early Christianity. As we said earlier, Mani himself was probably raised in a Christian sect, and later styled himself like the Apostle Paul. He also called himself the paraclete, or the one who intercedes on our behalf, a term that's usually applied to the Holy Spirit in Trinitarian Christianity. Throughout the 20th century, scholars of Syriac Christianity began to notice similarities between Mani's teachings and those of other varieties of early Christianity, such as Marcion. For example, Mani's interest in apostleship and positioning himself in the mold of the Apostle Paul seems to echo Marcion's own interest in Pauline Christianity. Marcion himself was a Paul fanboy. 
Christian heresiologists also suggest that Marcionism was entrenched in the Aramaic-speaking East and tied Mani with Marcion. Manichaean prayers and liturgies also draw heavily from Christian practice. In fact, some of the Manichaean psalms to Jesus that were discovered in Egypt are almost indistinguishable from Christian psalms. One psalm from the Coptic Manichaean psalm book basically praises Jesus in every single stanza. You would never have guessed it was a Manichaean prayer instead of a Christian prayer until the last few lines. Glory and victory to our Lord, our light, Mani and his holy elect. This last example demonstrates the Manichaean devotion to Jesus, although to a different type of Jesus than the one venerated by most 3rd and 4th century Christians, which led some Christian authorities to attack it as a heresy. These heresiologists frequently called Manichaeism madness, or manes in Greek, making a pretty obvious pun on Mani's name. One example of these heresy hunters is found on a 4th century papyrus from Egypt. Seen here written in a beautiful Greek hand by a trained scribe, it was carefully folded, as you can see here in the nine still visible folds. In this letter, a 4th century Christian bishop from Egypt warned his flock against the madness of the Manichaeans, warning them to be on their guard against these who with deceitful and lying words steal into our houses. Another Christian document writes, This false doctrine of different heresies and pagan beliefs was created with the treacherous and fraudulent intent of enticing all kinds of people. In fact, the Manichaeans worship many gods, thus wishing to please the pagans. Here it seems the author is annoyed by Manichaean universalism, as something that tries to entice all kinds of people. Scholars continue to debate the extent to which these adaptations influenced Manichaeism, in particular because it's so hard to determine a baseline that might go back to Mani himself. This makes it difficult to estimate to what extent certain elements belong to the original core of Mani's teachings, or represented secondary layers of additions. But I'd say we should not be so obsessed with searching for a core of Manichaeism. Scholars of religion have argued in recent years that it's a mistake to essentialize a religion, boil a religion down to a monolithic essence. I'd rather argue that the history of Manichaeism is a story of varieties of Manichaeism. Varieties of Manichaeism that adapted differently over the centuries, whether in Egypt, Iran, or in China. The recent excavations at the Egyptian village Ismat el Karab have demonstrated that loosely connected networks of Manichaean families lived in Egypt, supporting traveling elect, copying Manichaean books, and praying and singing together in congregation. In other words, they lived a very similar life to how Egyptian Christians would have supported a local holy man while gathering in houses or churches to perform prayers. Hundreds of years later, we see a very different kind of Manichaeism in the Uyghur and Chinese world, in which these beautiful manuscript illustrations were produced, and where Manichaeans made use of Buddhist-style temples. Up-close analysis of such historical and material sources contribute to a rich palette of a multicultural Manichaeism, a Manichaeism that spanned Egypt to Iran to China. If you'd like to learn more about Manichaeism, I'm including a bibliography in the description below, and I'd also like to invite you to an online seminar that I'm teaching about Gnosticism in the late antique Mediterranean world. So every month or so, I offer online seminars for about 10 to 15 people through the service Speakeasy. They basically help professors run online workshops. I really try to model these seminars after university seminars. So they're really discussion-based, hence the small group. This makes it a different experience than an explainer video where I'm just talking at you through the camera, or a live stream where I'm basically trying to answer hundreds of comments flying at me at the same time. This month's seminar is Intro to Gnosticism. It's a four-part seminar. We will examine some of the most important Gnostic texts and groups, as well as some of the most strident critics among early Christianity. For tickets, click on the link on screen or in the description below. Thanks, everyone.